Okay, in your handout for this workshop, there's a picture of a guy all covered in bees. There's also a picture of a prairie chicken. Now that you're wondering what these mean, we'll keep you in suspense. We'll talk about this later. A lot of people come to the subject of logic uh, thinking logic is a very intimidating kind of thing to talk about, intimidating subject. This workshop is about logic, and so you've been warned. <laughs> Some people came with ideas about logic, such as that logic is about winning arguments, like debates, or uh, you know, arguments between your siblings or with a talk show host or something. Some people think of logic as being about computer geeks, some sort of complicated computer language with codes and stuff. Some people think of uh, logic as being about bumper sticker bragging rights. My kid knows logic. This is quite common, actually. Some people think they're logical because they have a logic book on the shelf. That's not true. We're here in this workshop to explain a better picture of logic. But we're not going to define logic for you. We're going to define it through the course of this workshop. Um, you'll sort of discover it through the course of this workshop. Here's a comic. Do you think people are basically good or evil? Well, I know dogs are basically good. And dogs are better than people. But people are better than cats. And cats are evil. Therefore, all people are stupid. I don't follow that logic. Yes, my theory predicts you would say that. Thinking is hard work. It's sort of like climbing a hill. It's hard just to be, get to the top and be thinking at all. That's why we prefer to be something like a common couch potato. <laughs> just as our mind needs exercise, a body needs exercise, our mind needs exercise too. The mind is like a muscle. My point is, this is your brain. This is what most people's brains looks like. It's small and it's hard to use it. This is your brain on logic. <laughs> if we accomplish anything in this workshop, we want to convince you to use your mind, to exercise it. To, uh, logic is about raising your standards of thinking. Now my mom and my dad always said that we needed to have a, a new car. No, that's the wrong overhead, sorry. <laughs> An inquiring mind. We thought he was a good example of an acquiring mind. <laughs> this means things like learning to be open-minded, uh, li listening to other perspectives on issues. Um, here's an example of looking at other perspectives. Here there's a big eye in the window, and the lady's on the phone. Hello, Emily. This is Gladys Murphy up the street. Say, could you go to your window and describe what's in my front yard? An inquiring mind wants to look deeper into issues, deeper than just the surface, and learning to learn to recognize assumptions behind arguments. These are different issues we're going to be talking about in this workshop. Now we're going to be talking about fallacies. Fallacies, an example, a definition of a fallacy is a place where someone has made a mistake in his thinking. These are probably the most easy to understand and practical part of logic because we use them every day. So let's see an example of a fallacy. Dilbert cartoon. I read that it's easy to sculpt an elephant. There he is with a hammer and a chisel. You just start with a chunk of marble and remove everything that doesn't look like an elephant. Later, apparently this chunk of marble didn't have an elephant in it. <laughs> now Dilbert is committing a fallacy in this frame here. Now we're not sure what it is, but you know there's gotta be something wrong with that because obviously it isn't gonna work. But we're not sure what it is. Now we're going to bring up sort of a controversial topic here. How many of you remember this? <laughs> Y2K crisis. How many of you have a generator in your basement that you never use? <laughs> we have one. We actually had a lot of toilet paper that finally got used up a few years ago. <laughs> 
Uh, here's, here's, this is a magazine that was published before Y2K and obviously, obviously quit publishing it afterwards. It says, Y2K crisis, doomsday 2000, the threat is real. And has all these articles on Y2K and how it was going to happen, everything was going to collapse in year 2000. But the question is, why did we think Y2K was going to happen? How many of you thought something bad was, really bad was going to happen on that day? Just a few people admit to it. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, why did you think it was going to happen? Maybe it was because a reputable authority told me about Y2K that it was going to happen. Okay, let's look at some reputable authorities and what they said. Getting the year 2000 issue right is critical for every organization. Failure to get it right will affect the integrity of the payment system and the performance of the domestic and maybe even the global economy by William McDonough, president of the New York Federal Reserve Bank. Okay, so what is this guy an expert on? On money and finances. Okay, let's look at another one. The crash of 1929 will pale in comparison to the crash of the century. Layoffs will be rampant, unemployment will rise dramatically, and the economy will drown in a dismal depression. Obviously, that didn't happen, but it was said by Tony Keyes, who was an investment counselor. So what was he an authority on? On investments, also money. This brings us to our first fallacy. This is called a faulty appeal to authority. This is an appeal to someone who has no special knowledge in the area being discussed. So these people we were talking about, what were they authorities on? One guy was the president of a bank and the other guy was an investment counselor. Were either of these people authorities on computers? No. Oh. They, they had no special knowledge on whether computers were going to collapse. That is a faulty appeal to authority. Let me compare this to something you might understand a little better. You, my car won't run. What's wrong with it? Mechanic, hmm, it looks like you have a bro broken timing chain, warped camshaft, and the U-joints are shot. That will have to be fixed before it will run. So why do you trust your car mechanic here? Because, because he knows something about cars, and you might not know something about cars. OK, now let's look at another one. My car mechanic says the best way to fix computer problems is just to give the computer a good sharp kick. He says it should always work. So why would you not trust your mechanic now? Because he doesn't necessarily know anything about computers. So my point is, before Y2K, there were many authorities on Y2K. And some were, not, some were experts on computers, and some were not. And the, and the experts who weren't experts they were still talking about like it was going to happen anyway. Actually, there's two ways you can commit the faulty appeal to authority. This is when there is much controversy about the topic among respected authorities. Then simply appealing to only one authority is a faulty appeal to authority. For example, here we have some books written before Y2K. This one says, Y2K, stop the madness. And this is a person who is an expert on computers. And over here, this person thought it was going to happen. There were many authorities who were respected authorities on the topic who disagreed with each other. That is why, so what do we do when respected authorities disagree? When respected authorities disagree, you must find out on your own. You have to read both sides carefully and evaluate what they say, the evidence they give, not their credentials, but the evidence that they give. And then you have to decide for yourself. Okay, now we're going to test you guys on what you just learned. We all know that the planes which crashed into the World Trade Center were radio controlled by the government. That's a pretty dramatic statement there. Your mom. <laughs> okay, this isn't my mom, this is your mom. <laughs> So, should we trust this authority? No, why? Your mom probably doesn't know anything about that topic. She might know other things, but not that. She might know this. You need to eat your broccoli. It's good for you. Your mom. So, should you trust it now? Yes? How many say no? <laughs> so, your mom knows about your health. So she, you should do what she says. Here's another example. 
Children should always eat a balanced diet and get plenty of sleep. Your pediatrician. Okay, so should you trust him, your pediatrician, when he says this? Yes. Now, why should you trust him? What is he an authority on? Children's health, their health, and their well-being. Okay. Mm, let's look at another one. Parents should never inflict physical punishment like spanking on their children. It stunts their physical and emotional development. And who says this? Your pediatrician. <laughs> this is a different pediatrician. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so should you trust your pediatrician now? No, now why? So we have this pediatrician thinks that spanking is bad. Are there any other authorities who think it is good? Yes, there's much controversy on, on this topic. This pediatrician thinks it was it's bad, but my mom thought it was good. <laughs> okay, we're also going to talk about assumption fallacies. This is a different type of fallacy. To illustrate this, I drew this. Not, I'm not very good at drawing, so. This, this, is a, this is a Q. It looks like a 9, but it's a Q. Here we have these letters, A, B, C, Q. Is any of the, these letters different from the others? Say, for instance, the A is the only vowel. Okay. Do any, do any of them stand out as being different? It's, it's, Everybody's seen this before. The Don't Q say is anything. different because it's out of alphabetical order. You have A, B, C, Q. Okay. But then you also have the C, which is the only one with is, is an opening. The, all these are, are closed symbols. Or what about the B, where the, the symbol, the, the, the staff or opening is on the uh, left side instead of the right side, which is all the others? Do you think, could we make it maybe the case that? Each, is, each of these is different in, you know, it's in its own way, maybe. Now, is there something about this, you know, what I've been saying here, that's been leading you to assume something? So for instance, what about the big T in the middle? It's bigger than all the others. It doesn't have any circles in it. It's out of alphabetical order. Maybe you thought it was part of the diagram, maybe, or something? That was an illustration of an assumption. Assumption fallacies are fallacies where someone assumes something that isn't proven. I think I have a cold. At least it isn't an echinacea cold. You take echinacea because you think you might be catching a cold. Then when you stop taking it, you get an even worse cold because you stopped. That's why real doctors don't recommend taking echinacea. How do you know that? What, what are real doctors? Real doctors know more than those health nut doctors like Dr. D, who recommends taking herbs because he sells them. How do you know the difference between a real doctor and the other kind? Because real doctors are smarter. How do you know they're smarter? It's obvious they're smarter. They don't recommend taking echinacea. <laughs> Our argument is going in a circle. No, it isn't. I've got it too, Omar, a strange feeling like we've just been going in circles. With this joke, it usually takes people a minute There's to There's the it. first group that laughs, and then 1,000, 2,000, and then everybody else laughs. <laughs> Doctors who don't recommend taking echinacea are smarter. Now, why are they smarter? Well, it's going in a circle. Doctors recommend taking echinacea are smarter. Why? Because they don't recommend taking echinacea. This is called circular reasoning. An argument which says A is true because B is true and B is true because A is true, is using circular reasoning. You end up assuming the very thing you need to prove in the first place. Now here's another assumption fallacy. It's Calvin. Yeah. <laughs> you have Calvin fans here. <laughs> yes, Calvin, may I be excused, please? Again, I have to go, bad. All right, thank you. What are you doing home? I had to go. <laughs> An equivocation changes the meaning of a word in the middle of an argument. Here, Calvin uh, is using two meanings of the word go. We just, we just, everyone is assuming Calvin is meaning the same thing. Here's another example. Everybody knows that man is the only rational being. Therefore, women are irrational. 
Here we are using two different meanings of the word man. Man is in mankind, and then man is in male versus female. That's an equivocation. Here's another one. A bushel is a unit of weight equal to four pecks. What's a peck? A quick smooch. <laughs> you know, I don't understand math at all. <laughs> Here Calvin is making an assumption about the meaning of the word peck. Okay, uh, here's an assumption. <laughs> And we have well, what assumption is being made in this cartoon? We have the shelves way, way up on the ceiling, and it says, Inconvenience Stores. What assumption is being made here? <laughs> that you can't reach the, well, he can't reach he the can. merchandise. It, it, you can't reach the merchandise. It's way up there. What assumption well, is that's being not, made that's here? that's an assumption. I mean, it is, but it's not the, what's? That, it, that it's not, well, it's inconvenient. It is inconvenient. That other stores are convenient? Well, they're more convenient than this. The assumption is being made by you. You're assuming this has something to do with logic, and it doesn't. <laughs> if, this, if this logical fallacy stuff is confusing, we put some uh, more stuff about logical fallacies in the handout, and we're going to be explaining more about these things as we go on. Okay, let's talk about statistical fallacies. This is fallacies committed when you're doing statistics. Okay, we're gonna bring up another controversial topic. The story I'm going to show you is basically true. I've changed some of the details to make it more interesting. <laughs> News flash. Scientists now believe that rock music causes stress and lowers productivity in people. A recent study on laboratory animals has revealed some astounding results. It seems that animals that are under the influence of heavy rock music have lower physical performance and more depressed outlook on life than animals that have listened to classical music. These results aren't exactly unexpected, says Bert Jones of a research institute. Rock music gives me a headache, but I never thought the res results would be, would be this extreme. Okay, so didn't that look like a typical news story? Like something you would read somewhere? And in fact, for some of you, I mean, it, made, it made a lot of sense that rock music would rot your brain, yeah. It's kind of, that beat is kind of bad. Well, let's take a closer look behind the scenes to find out what actually happened in this study. Okay, Bert's graduate thesis. Bert thought rock music was bad for people, so he decided to do his graduate thesis on the topic. He took two cows, Annabelle and Bessie. And for one month, Annabelle listened to Mozart in headphones, while Bessie preferred the Beatles. At the end of the month, Bert noticed that Annabelle was more calm. She acted contented, ate less, and produced more milk. All good things for a cow. That's good. What happened to Bessie? Well, she was more rebellious. She ate more, produced less milk, and grew a horn. <laughs> when Bert noticed this, he concluded that classical music made you relaxed and increased your productivity, while rock music made you nervous and lazy. Okay, what's wrong with this study? There's a lot of things wrong with this study. First of all, how many cows did he study and what kind were they? Well, he studied two cows and we have a Holstein and we have a Jersey. Holstein and Jersey cow. This commits the fallacy of a hasty generalization. This is when someone generalizes about a class based on a small or very poor sample. Bert only examined two cows. This isn't enough to make a conclusion about all cows. Just two, because these could be flute cows. They could react to music differently than all the other cows. Also, the cows weren't representative of cows, because if you study two breeds, you need to study more breeds in order to make a conclusion. These are you know, Holstein, Jersey, what some other brands. Brands. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Guernsey or... Uh, or meat cow or something. He needs to examine other breeds of cows. But I know you've been wondering, you've been wondering, why is Bert studying cows when he's talking about some humans? Here's an example of four cows, and here's an example of four humans. Well, I don't know, they're good examples of humans. But anyway. <laughs> this commits the fallacy of a weak analogy. This is where someone can claims that two things are similar, but they're actually very different. 
humans and cows are very different, if you didn't notice that. Cows might react badly to music, especially rock music, while humans might be okay with it. He doesn't know that. In order to make that conclusion, a connection between those, he has to prove how cows react the same way to music as humans. Generally speaking, this was a bad study. We kind of exaggerated the badness of it to make our point. <laughs> you shouldn't believe a study until you understand how it was conducted, sort of the, the behind the scenes of how they came up with the evidence that they did. Did some of you, since we're in a homeschool crowd, want to agree with this study? Like, didn't you know, wanted to believe yeah. that rock music was bad for you and this is all true? Okay, there's a few hands. Okay. Most people are perverted rock music people, I guess. <laughs> so, some of you are happy with our example that we shot down this argument, and some of our maybe aren't as happy. We like ruined your best argument, maybe. But we're not trying to support rock music. We don't listen to rock music ourselves. But our point is we want to make you think about research and about things like this. If you use a bad study to support a true conclusion, let's say the, the conclusion that rock music was bad, and let's say that was true, but you still used a bad study to support it, what would happen? What's something that happens when you support something with bad reasoning? Your credibility is lost. You, you lose your credibility, yes. The people you're trying to convince will get convinced the other way later on. When something else comes along. You need to find reasons that stick, reasons that an inquiring mind can feel good about for the things you believe. Okay. What do you think of when you hear the term propaganda? Actually, who do you think of when you hear the term propaganda? What are some examples? Politicians. Politicians, yes, yes, politicians. Nazi. Nazi, ooh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Propaganda is about manipulating. Here's an example of propaganda. Pay up, squirt. Forget it, Mo. I'm not giving you money. In fact, I don't even have any. Gee, that's too bad. Oh, wait, yes, I do here. For a kid with a monosyllabic vocabulary, he's awfully persuasive. <laughs> here, Calvin is being persuaded by fear. It's a propaganda technique. Propaganda is when someone plays with our emotions in a way to designed to make us do something without thinking through the matter carefully. Propaganda you can find everywhere, especially in political speeches, in the courtroom, and the most common, is what we're, we're going to be talking about, is in advertisements. Here's an example of an advertisement that uses propaganda. It says, go ahead, be shallow, choose us for our looks. That's what propaganda is all about. Okay, and so one day we, we were trying to find an example of propaganda for this workshop, and it came in the mail that day. And how many of you have got this in the mail? We get this like every month. <laughs> yeah, some people have got it. It says, Secrets of Robust Health, The Silent Killers, The Secret World of Parasites. So when we read that up there, we're like, oh, we start fearing something. We're not sure what it is. But so we need to read further down. It says, I believe the single most undiagnosed health challenge in the history of the human race is parasites. That's a pretty broad statement. Said by Dr. Ross Anderson, one of America's foremost parasitic infection specialists. But what, is it, what does it mean by Dr. Ross Anderson? What is he a doctor of? Well, it, doesn't, it doesn't say what he's a doctor of. He might be a doctor of basket weaving as far as we know. And he's one of America's foremost parasitic infection specialists. What does that mean? You don't know what it means. But I just never mind that. Let's read. It says, place photo here. The photograph we didn't dare place on the front cover appears on page three. So of course we have to turn to page three quickly. Woo, there they are. The world's most disgusting picture gallery, parasites and humans. And this one here has teeth. See, that's nasty. Ooh, they go, oh, I wonder if those things are crawling around inside me. What are the symptoms of parasites? Okay, well, they have the symptoms of parasites, it says. Pains or aches in the back, joints or muscles. Okay, vague there, okay. Allergies, okay. Eating more than normal but still being hungry. Nervousness or grumpiness. 
He's got parasites in here. <laughs> Various skin problems. Problems sleeping, immune system problems, tooth grinding or clenching. My favorite one is this. Excess weight. <laughs> Everybody's got parasites. <laughs> okay, so we turn to page seven to solve the problem. And yes, you know what they have. They're selling something, okay? This one says, powerful all natural cleansing kit. What does it mean by all natural? It doesn't say, vague. America's best selling cleansing program. What does it mean by best selling? Maybe it's their best selling product. Maybe it's the only product that they sell. Experts agree. Who are the experts? Of course, how much does this cost? It's like seven, $70 plus shipping and handling. It's a lot of money. OK, this uses several propaganda techniques. Called, most notably, it's appeal to fear. It makes us so afraid we don't ask them to prove what they're saying. We just read it and accept it because we're scared. Exigency. This is hurry up. We don't have time to think. We've got to do it quickly before the parasites eat us up. Faulty appeal to authority, what we talked about before. What type of doctor is saying this? It doesn't say. And this is a big one. It's just vague things, vague statements. It could mean anything you want them to mean. Okay, here's another example of propaganda and advertisements. This is, we have a very old looking door here. Juan Valdez and Associates, aromatherapy since 1960. Cafe de Colombia, the richest coffee in the world. We have this kind of antique, I don't know, kind of picture, shadow of a guy with a donkey or something. It looks very old, unique. This must be good coffee, right? This is using something called appeal to tradition. This is where someone encourages us to do something because it is associated with something old. If something has a lot of tradition behind it, a lot of memories behind it, it must be a good thing for us, right? OK, but what about this one? A fallacy can be used to support something good. Here we have a track we found in a church once, 10 reasons to believe in the Bible. Okay. Reason number two is the Bible's preservation. In a cave by the Dead Sea, a 2,000-year-old copy of Isaiah was found. It is essentially the same as the book of Isaiah that appears in our Bibles. God preserved his word from error. Okay, if I summarize this, this is essentially saying the Bible is very old, it hasn't changed over thousands of years, and so it's true, I guess. Isn't this the same as the Cafe de Columbia ad? The Bible isn't true just because it's very old. There are many false religions that are very old, beautiful, romantic, all sorts of things. You should never use bad reasoning to support something that's, that's true because you lay a weak foundation for other people's faith. There are many reasons to believe in the Bible, but this is not one of them. Okay, let's talk about some other propaganda techniques. I'm going to test you on these later. Remember t your handout? that we talked about before. You're going to see that in a minute. Transfer. This is probably the most common propaganda technique in advertisements. This is where an advert tries to make us transfer our good or our bad feelings about one thing to a totally unrelated thing. For example, here's an advertisement for our book here. Here we have a nice peaceful road that goes off into the distance there, and it says, Gain inner peace by the Palestine Detective. And what we want you to do is to look at the picture and feel all happy and sweet, all the nice flowers, yes, and then look over here and go, I want to buy that. <laughs> That's what transfer does. Here's another example of transfer. Here we have a happy domestic scene. This is a proud father, a logical son. And our book down here. <laughs> we want you to think that if you just Buy that book, you will have a happy family. <laughs> Here's another example of transfer. What do the tropics smell like? Like the lush, exotic freshness of tropical bloom down here. Here we have this product coming out of a tiger lily, which doesn't grow in the tropics, so I don't know why they have there. <laughs> but they're transferring. This is a common thing with cleaning stuff, because you'll have like a a shot of a nice, clean, perfectly white kitchen, and then their cleaning product. 
So if you just buy the product, your kitchen will be clean. You know? <laughs> Exigency. This, we talked about this a little while ago. This is used when nothing more than a time limit is given for you to do what someone wants. Genuine lead teacups, now 95% off. Hurry while supplies last. They're hoping that you'll go down and buy it really quickly before you look at it carefully. Oh, lead teacups. Probably don't want lead teacups. Bandwagon. This is used when someone wants us to do something just because a lot of other people are doing it. This is used a lot too. Buy the fallacy detective. Over 10 million copies already sold. If you look at it very, very carefully, you can notice it's 10.0. <laughs> Snob appeal is actually the opposite of bandwagon, and it works too. It's, it's very effective. Buy this because hardly anybody else does, because you will be better than everybody else. For example, buy skunk brand perfume, you will stand out in the crowd. <laughs> Snob appeal is used a lot in car advertisements, like this one here. Here we have a picture of a Nissan here, and it's pa just passed up a Ferrari back here. Which I don't know why they put that, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it says, may promote feelings of superiority. That's snob appeal. Because cars are associated with your ego a lot, so they, they appeal to this emotion when they do a car advertisements. High tech. High tech is, um, High tech is like the opposite of the tradition one. This is used when someone makes it sound like his product is the latest thing. It isn't necessarily going to be the best thing, but it's the latest thing, for example. You need to buy those, a pair of those new Nyko shoes. They have high tech dino traction. It's a new special feature that helps you cling onto the back of a running dinosaur without falling off. By the way, any resemblances to any person, place, or thing, living or dead, in this workshop just might be on purpose. <laughs> Here's an example of the high tech. It says, the most exciting thing to happen to gums since teeth. It says, new. It says, new Listerine essential care toothpaste. All, everything on here says, new, new, new. That's high tech. Ah, remember your handout. Okay, so what propaganda technique is used in this? Car insurance with no State Farm agent. Now that makes me nervous. Here this guy is covered in bees, and he must be pretty brave because he's covered in bees. Well, supposedly they say they don't sting when they're like that. I don't believe it at all. <laughs> he's pretty brave, but he's not brave enough not to have a State Farm agent. So what propaganda technique is this? Fear? Feel the fear. That's yeah. He's he's a brave person. All right, what about the other one? This one we haven't covered, and it's kind of vague. But we have this prairie chicken, and it says 19,500 acres is a lot of open space, especially when your stride is only two inches long. Well, that doesn't make any sense, but anyway, evidently Phillips Petroleum Company bought some land for the prairie chicken to live on and they have an advertisement about it. So what emotion does this stir up trying to get you to buy your gas from Phillips Petroleum? Because they care about, they are taking care of the environment. So what kind of an emotion would that be? Like a pity, like a pity thing? Yeah, it is kind of a pity because you pity the prairie chickens or you want to help the prairie chickens or you want to buy their gas. It's kind of an appeal to uh, philanthropy, because they help the environment, so we want to help them. So it's kind of a, your appeal to your philanthropy. OK, let's look at some other ones I have here. You've, we've covered these. What propaganda technique is on this one? Up here. It's transfer. It's transfer, yes, because it, I mean, it's nice you know, mountain scenery, and they just lowered that thing with a helicopter probably right there. <laughs> You know, they want you to transfer your feelings on that one. What about this one? This one actually uses a lot of propaganda techniques, all in one. Here we have 
It says here, established in 1935. We have an old one that says reestablished every year since, and we have a new Chevy Suburban. Tradition, yes, that's right, because we have an old little picture in the corner. But what also is it? What, yeah, what emotion is, would this appeal to? Family. Family, yes, we have a nice, happy scene right here, a nice, happy domestic scene. They're all, if you just buy the Suburban, you'll be one happy family <laughs> fighting in the car. <laughs> but what's the, what, is, what was the opposite of the tradition one? The high tech. And how is high tech used here? Because it's the new Suburban. What other, can you see any other ones in here? Transfer. transfer. Where's the transfer? What does it say right here? What does it say right there? Lack of rock. So what are they transferring between? You think about a rock. Rock is hard. Suburban is hard. It won't break down. Supposedly, yes. No, right. OK, what about this one? This one is used a lot these days. It says, my kid finishes his homework so, this is a bumper sticker, homework so fast I'm worried he'll start a band. Like, what does that mean? I don't know. You sit there for like five minutes looking at it. And, what does that mean? What does that mean? And by then, you've read the whole thing all the way through, and you're ready to buy it. So what this is, and this is used a lot. You'll have, you see an advertisement that just doesn't make any sense. It's just kind of weird and funny. But that catches your attention and keeps you thinking about it, and then you think about their products more. But is there anything else on here that uses another propaganda technique? Fear? Where would fear be? Because you want your kid, you don't want them. Ah, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. But what is that? What else does it, can you read what other things it says on here? Smart parents want even smarter kids. What was that? Snob appeal, yeah. That's a good example of snob appeal. Oh, here's another big. What, what emotions are in this one? Your tradition, yeah, like a traditional kind of family, yes. Yeah, it's transfer too because I mean, you join the army, you're gonna have a happy family. What what what's a big one that these kind of advertisements would use? What a kind of emotion would it appeal to? Patriotic. Yeah, a patriotic kind of a thing because they have the American flag down here and all that. I think that is all I have here. <clears throat> okay, we talked about so far logical fallacies because logical fallacies are a good sample of the other parts of logic, and they're also we think it's the most useful part of logic. Now, many times you will hear someone say something that doesn't make sense, like in the cartoon at the beginning of this workshop, and it's a fallacy. But you, you don't, you don't, you can't. Unless you know the name of it, you can't explain what that fallacy was. You just kind of know there's something wrong there. That's because we believe everyone is born with a kind of logic in their, in their mind. You're born with logic. And we need to strengthen that logic, exercise it, and use it to serve God. God gave us inquiring minds, and we need to... We don't want to lose that gift. Okay, now... I'm going to go through a suggested course of study, some books you can use to learn logic and train your mind. In your handout is a list of books and some more descriptions. We started our journey with logic with these books, The Building Thinking Skills by Critical, Think Critical Thinking Press, back in 1988. My mom found these books back then there weren't any real logic books available except these. These are for kids, um, for kids under the age of 13. They're very fun workbooks. I, I have very fond memories of going through these. I love, love doing these. Work, probably the, one of the few workbooks I enjoy doing. Um, these teach pre-logic skills. These don't teach logic. They, th they teach things like uh, uh, finding similarities, sequences, classifications, analogies. These are building, building thinking skills. These are building the, the blocks in your head that will go further later on, will develop into more logical thinking. Now at age 13, we believe kids are more ready 
for more formal logic skills, logic training studies. It, now, we think a good logic book needs to be at least 200 years old. That's because it needs a lot of tradition behind it to get sort of so you respect it. It needs a leather binding because it's so dynamic subject. It kind of yeah. tends to. I think this is the wrong list. <laughs> that was a joke. A good logic book needs to be self teaching. For homeschoolers, it needs to be self teaching. It needs to be practical. Self teaching, I mean, you don't know logic. Parents. Homeschool parents usually don't know the logic themselves, and so they need to learn it along with their kids. And so a self-teaching text is very important. Practical, because logic it can be somewhat esoteric, you know, mathematical kind of thing. And you need to focus on the practical use of the subject to get people's attention. And it needs to be Christian, because logic in the secular world is um, something that's very... Uh, logic is, is closely, tied with your closely tied to your worldview. And in the secular world, it's the perfect place to insert a whole bunch of political correctness. And so you need to uh, learn logic from a Christian perspective. Now, this is not an advertisement. <laughs> this is our book, The Fallacy Detective. This is, we wrote it as a e to be an easy start to logic. This would be for kids um, ages 13 through adult. So adults can do it, and ages 13 can do it. It covers uh, the logical fallacies we covered in this workshop and a lot more logical fallacies. There are many, many logical fallacies. They've been um, researched over the years. It teaches inquiring mind principles, like what we talked about in this workshop. And it, it's come from a Christian perspective. Now, after that, if you're wondering what to do with that, you could go to our next book. <laughs> now, this is a very dull book. It's very boring. Uh, it could be used after the fallacy detective. The fallacy detective teaches you how to recognize bad reasoning. That's what we did in this workshop, is recognizing bad reasoning in, in, in political things and in, in advertisements. The thinking toolbox gives you tools for helping you to build good reasoning, like scientific thinking. Um, it teaches you reasons for uh, how to communicate reasons for why you believe what you believe, uh, how to ev evaluate opposing viewpoints and uh, scientific method, tools for the scientific method, and other principles. Now, after that, we would recommend uh, Douglas Wilson and James Nance's introductory logic video series. This is a good video series for learning classical deductive syllogisms. This is challenging. This book is a challenging book. Um, but it helps you think in logical categories. That's what classical logic teaches, how to think in categories, how to come to um, accurate conclusions from those categories. You can think of this book as being, this series, as being about as difficult as an algebra text. So if you remember what algebra was like, that's what this is going to be like. And James Nance's uh, videos, um, co they cover additional material that the book doesn't cover, and that's why I recommend the videos also. Now, adding logic to your curriculum can be difficult. You're sort of stepping out of the mold. You're not being like other people when you study logic. You're being better than other people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a snob appeal. Now, when I was 13, our parents decided to teach us logic. It was kind of unusual at that point. We were stepping out of the mold. And the burden to teach logic fell on my mom's shoulders. <laughs> Learning logic from a woman can be difficult. Now, my mom gave me permission to say that because she thinks that's the case. Some people don't like that. But I wish Dad had taught logic. One of the reasons dads need to learn logic is to learn it themselves, to be the local logician of the house. Because if kids learn logic and their parents don't, what happens? <laughs> You're going to have trouble, trouble. Now, if you want to learn more about st uh, things about logic, you can go to our website, christianlogic.com, where we have a, a discussion board. We have articles on logic, and we have um, different resources on, on logic for people. Now, what did you get out of this workshop? We tried to give you the idea that logic is doable and fun. It's something that you can conquer, and it's a fun subject. It's not something really boring or something. It's really fun. And you can't live without logic. Bad logic is everywhere. You need logic to be able to discern that. You need higher standards of reasoning. Anything else? Surely you got something out of this workshop. 
Did we irritate terms, you? Some, learn some terms. Yeah. Did we irritate you? We tried to. <laughs> <laughs> we, we actually did try to irritate you, but that's because logic isn't, you don't think of logic as being a problem with the other guy, like liberals out there or the media or something like that. Logic is about reevaluating re your own reasoning. Logic with humility. You can think of it as being, you're the most illogical person you know. You may not actually be the, that, but you can think of it that way. Because it's important to have humility when studying logic. Now for a dramatic close. Drum roll. Terrific explosion. Speakers disappear. Lights come back on. Any questions? Any questions? <laughs> Any questions? Yes? You said that others need to learn logic. Once we get past this stage of teaching our children logic, what do you recommend for the, uh, the next step after The next, fa fa father, you, you, yes, we th think fathers should teach logic. It's all right if moms teach logic, too. It's not like women are less logical. We don't agree with that. Men and women are about as logical. But, we think lot, dads need to do logic because that's one of the subjects that um, can be very interesting for a guy. And uh, moms tend to take on too much as it is. And just as adding a subject like logic to dads, maybe could take it on. And you're asking, after we learn, like, maybe re restate your question. I, I didn't. You're asking what to do after the Nance books? Yeah. Most people. You could study apologetics. That might be a thing you could study. You could study um, theology. You could study my favorite subject, philosophy. <laughs> um, something like that. You could have go get into debate. That's a very good thing for, for learning logic and, and learning to apply it is in a debate setting or writing speeches. Writing is a good thing. Other questions? Yes? In a Christian perspective, because um, with today, you know, people can say, "Well, it's just not logical that uh, someone, a person, could live 969 years like Methuselah. It's just it's not logical." And they can come up with, "It's not logical that um, I don't know." Just in general, they can come dictate things from the Bible and say that's a not logical. A lot of people use the word logical incorrectly. They throw because it they, around. They throw the word logical around like you're illogical. When they're not actually being very logical about the use of that term. Because logic just has to do with errors in your reasoning. It doesn't have to do with whether you're right or wrong. Because you can have someone who is wrong and be completely logical about the way they're being wrong. I know that sounds weird, but it's true. They could have the wrong assumptions about things. They start with the wrong assumptions. They come to a wrong conclusion. But in the process of it, they don't use logical fallacies, necessarily. And so they are more logical. But they're still wrong. So when someone says, well, you believe the Bible, that's illogical, they're not using the term logical very correctly, because that's a very vague statement there. Any other, other questions? Other questions? Yes? What fields would logic be specifically useful for? Um, well, we feel logic is useful for pretty much everything. Everything you do. Maybe not art. I don't know. but <laughs> uh, Science, uh, math. Uh, we're just, just in, uh, in business. It's very helpful in business learning to discern um, when you're, when, when, when like someone's giving you a sales pitch and knowing whether, whether they're making sense or not. Uh, that's why we got into the subject, because we think it's very useful, just not a lot of people teach it. You need to be better than that. Over here. Yeah. Why do you not recommend um, doing workbooks with, the ch with children under the age of 10? Why we do the, the logic books, not doing the logic books before age 10? Um, or the building thinking skills. Or the building thinking skills before age 10. I guess some people do. It's not going to ruin your children, but we just feel that at that age they're not as interesting to the kids. Um, if the kids are interested in it, certainly they, you can have them do whatever they would want to do. It isn't going to help them as much. At and there's no reason to hurry. Uh, 
it's a lot important. of people will try to teach logic to their kids, you know, really young, and they're and the kids don't get it, head. and they're kind of they get this impression that logic is boring and this horrible subject my mom tried to make me learn and I wasn't ready for it. And so to, I want, you want logic to be something exciting to the kids. Thinking, you know, I enjoy thinking. This is, I can do this and, and it's fun and, and I'm not afraid of it. So I guess there, there's no big hurry about doing it as young as possible. Oh, well, there's uh, Alice in Wonderland that they, you, the guy was, he was like a mathematician, wasn't he? And Luke threw, Carroll, yeah. Yeah, he threw out all those, those two books. He uses all these logical fallacies, and you can sit there and point them all out because he did it all on purpose. <laughs> Maybe we should close. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat>